Dear friends in Jesus Christ, today our text is in John chapter 3, so of course we have the famous John chapter 3 verse 16 that we all know about, but earlier on in the chapter, that is where we come to the topic of being born again, and Jesus said a person must be born again or he cannot see the kingdom of God. So being born again is a really important thing. If I would have asked you before the service today, if I would have come up to you and said, are you born again? Would you have even understood what that meant? Would you know what to say? Would you know how to respond? Well, let's get into that today so we can all understand better what Jesus was talking about when he said, you must be born again. Coming to the setting here, we are in, again, John chapter 3, picking up in verse 1, the Bible says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So it tells us here that the meeting took place under the cover of darkness, and the meeting included, of course, Nicodemus and Jesus. But we have good reason to believe, though, that at least the Apostle John was also there. He's the one who wrote down this account. And then also we believe probably the other disciples that Jesus had recently called, which would include Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. It doesn't matter so much if they were there or not, but there's a good chance that they were. Jesus is being very instructive to Nicodemus, and these are things that would be important for his disciples to hear and to know and to understand as well. Notice that Nicodemus, he begins with a nice compliment. Nicodemus also, by his coming, he's interested, he is curious, he wants to learn. That's an important thing. I'm willing to sit down with anyone in the whole world and talk with them about the things of God. And yet, sadly, so many say, no thanks, not interested. Oh, what a sad thing. Nicodemus, he was interested. That was so important. And then in the second part here, we see Jesus got right to the point. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, That is not the best translation of the Greek. Really, Jesus said, unless one is born from above, that's what the Bible says, unless one is born from above, he cannot see. What does that mean? See, experience, enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? So Jesus told Nicodemus about his own helplessness. That's really what he was conveying here. He was telling him that everyone must be born from above in order to be with God forever. It's not something you do. It's something that God has to do. You must be born from above. And then we can see the way Nicodemus responded. He wasn't saying, oh, that's crazy, and walk away. But rather, he asked a question, trying to understand he was interested. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So what did Jesus do here? He told Nicodemus how to be born again. He said, it is by water and the spirit. Now in our world today, there are plenty of people that go around saying, I'm a born again Christian. Do we tend to say that as Lutherans? We don't. Could we say it as Lutherans? We could. Let's think a little bit about the differences between what some are saying versus what we are believing based on the Bible. 
Think about it like this. So first of all, Jesus said, by water and the Spirit, and anyone who is born again or born from above, what does that mean? It means they are spiritually alive. So think about when God created Adam and Eve, they were alive in two ways, physically alive, spiritually alive. What happened when they fell into sin? Immediately, they died spiritually. They continued to live physically for quite a while, finally dying physically, but as soon as they fell into sin, they died spiritually. What did God do? God promised that in time, he would send his son and through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ and through God working from above to give the gift of faith by which people would trust in Jesus, then they would have spiritual life again. But it's not something anyone automatically has like Adam and Eve did. When people are born, they are physically alive, but the Bible tells us they are spiritually dead. So God has to work to make them spiritually alive, to make them alive in Christ. Uh, going with a little comparison here real quick. So some people who would not agree with how we're looking at this topic, they would say that the way they are born again is they have to choose or they have to accept Jesus. The problem is the Bible teaches we don't have the ability to do that, but that's what they're teaching. And then they would talk about once they make that choice that they're experiencing this renewal. Now we have to be careful to emphasize experience, but for any one of us who happened to be, let's say an adult, and we were not in Christ, and then by the work of the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, that God brought us to Christ. We don't emphasize the experience, but we know though that was an awesome thing that, oh my goodness, I was dead in my sins and on my way to hell. And because what God just did, now I'm alive in Christ and I'm on my way to heaven. We don't emphasize the experience, but they do though emphasize the experience. We have to be a little bit careful in doing that with the experience. What they say then is that once they've had this experience, the teachings of the Bible become real. It's not just a, an old book, but the teachings are real. The relationship is personal, but they make no mention of water. Now, once in a while, I have one article here that, that I went through, but once in a while, you'll hear them try to use the idea of water. So then they want to talk about the water that is inside that was inside our moms before we, were, before we were born. But that has nothing to do with being born again, though. That has to do with our first birth, but not with our second birth. So they don't really know what to do with the water because they don't want to get into the topic of baptism. How are we looking at it? We're trying to look at what the Bible says. So the Bible is clear there, like in Titus chapter three, Acts chapter two, and other places as well. It's clear that God is working from above. He's working down upon us. He's working by the Holy Spirit. He's working through the word and he's also working in conjunction with the water. So God is at work in all those ways in order to make us spiritually alive. Of course, when that happens, when we think about the teachings of the Bible, they should be real. But of course, we're talking though about a child being baptized and what is a huge, huge failure among Lutheran parents? Not among all Lutheran parents, but so many of them, they have their children baptized into Christ, but they fail big time. They fail to impress the word of God upon their children with every opportunity, just like the Bible teaches in Deuteronomy chapter six. It is such a critical thing. What should happen is that as the ch children are growing older, they are learning the word of God more and more, and the teachings of the Bible are becoming understood by them, and they are real to them, and they believe those teachings. But how many, though, young people, and I was in this category two years ago, 
that I went through the motions of going to church and going to Sunday school, but my parents weren't doing any impressing of the Word of God upon me because really, they, honestly, they didn't know any better. If they would have somehow known they should have been doing that, maybe they would have been, but they just didn't know, so I didn't get it. And then we kind of wake up one day and we're thinking that we're, that, that we're good people and that God's going to welcome us into heaven. That's what happens within the Lutheran church. Then we have people walk away from the Lutheran church because they're like, that doesn't make sense. I was baptized and here I am living like the devil. That baptism must not have done anything. People come to that kind of a conclusion, but that's because, again, so often Lutheran parents are not following what the Bible calls us to follow. Now, for Cedric and Heather, they are such glowing examples of doing such a great job with their children. I don't think I've ever seen parents do better than they are doing with their young children, but that is not, that is not the rule. That is very much the exception. But God does talk, though, how he works by the Spirit through the Word, through the water and through the Word. So what is the outcome? For people who are talking about being born again in a way that is kind of unusual for us, for people who have a personal relationship with Jesus, for people who believe the Bible, for people who are trusting in Jesus, for people who are living for Christ, hey, those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, we could talk about being born again, too, but we want to be careful here and not just say, well, yeah, I was born again, I was baptized into Christ, and now we forget about that. But what do we say, though? We don't say, I was baptized, something that happened a long time ago and doesn't mean anything to me today, but we say, I am baptized. That means I am still clothed in Christ. I still have my God-given faith in Jesus. I have spiritual life. I have the forgiveness of my sins. I'm a member of the kingdom of God. For the ones who walk away from that, they don't have it anymore. But what does God want to do? God wants to reconnect people to Jesus and the great benefits that he won for us. So the blessings are there. But unfortunately, a lot of people get disconnected from them. If you think you might be disconnected, please, let's talk about it. God wants certainly to reconnect you. Going on to the third part here, uh, Jesus explained a little bit about being born again. He said to Nicodemus, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Thinking about Nicodemus, keep in mind he was a very important Jewish leader. He was a person who has probably known the Old Testament laws since he was a child. He tried to be very careful to keep them, and he probably thought, I've got an advantage over other people on being with God forever. When Jesus told him, though, that he must be born from above, that was a way for Jesus to say to Nicodemus, you are helpless to save yourself. I don't care what your position is. I don't care what you have done in life. You cannot make yourself spiritually alive. That is something that God has to do for you. When we think about it, we understand then that from our mothers, we have our physical life. From God, we have spiritual life. So we want to keep that straight. It's a very fundamental thing. Jesus talked there about the wind, how long ago they didn't understand, oh, we have the wind coming and going, and they didn't quite understand all about that. Today we have a little bit better idea as we can have a satellite and we can see the world and we can see kind of where the wind is coming from and where it is going to some extent. But what was Jesus saying, though, to Nicodemus? He was saying, in a sense, you don't have to understand everything I'm saying, just believe what I am saying. Aren't there so many things in life where we don't quite understand it, but yet we believe it? 
Now for Klaus, he knows what happens when you turn the key in your car or you push the button. He understands all the details about that. How many of us, though, we get into our car, we turn the key or we push the button, and we don't really have any idea what's going on, but we're thankful, though, when the engine starts. We, we don't have to know all the details in order to have the benefits of being able to drive a car that is running. Jesus is saying, believe what I'm saying. You don't need to know all the details. And in the Bible, there are mysteries that God has not revealed to us. Simply believe. In the fourth part here, I think Nicodemus really wanted to understand. So Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? In a sense, he was saying, okay, I believe what you're saying, but how is this possible? Seems to be what he was asking here. Now, when we think about talking to people who maybe are not alive in Christ, what should we do? We should always share the word of God with them. Now, let's be honest. A lot of times we can share the word of God and people give no response. But when they do give a response, what should we do? We should be so glad to get into a conversation with them and say, oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Let me show you a little bit more in the Bible what God means by that. And oh, by the way, do you have any more questions? And try to engage in a conversation with them. We should seize the opportunities that God allows into our lives. In the fifth part here, Jesus explained how he knows the truth. Now, some people at Jesus' time, maybe many people thought, this guy is radical, this guy is a false teacher. So now Jesus is going to tell Nicodemus, hey, you can trust me because let me tell you where I came from, let me tell you who I am. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we, we believe that's talking about Jesus and John the baptizer. We speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. Did you get all that he was saying there? Let's break that down a little bit. First of all, Jesus seems to be a little bit frustrated with Nicodemus because he calls him the teacher of Israel. Not a teacher, but the teacher of Israel. Nicodemus, he may have had the highest teaching position of anybody in Israel, and yet the sad thing is he did not know the fundamentals. He did not know the basics of sin and salvation. What a sad situation. What do we have going on in our world today? There are so many religious teachers who don't know the basics. They themselves are in trouble and they are trying to lead a congregation. What do we have? We have the blind leading the blind. It's a really bad situation. It is so important that we know the truth of God's word, and you should only be listening to someone who is telling you the Bible, not telling you their own ideas and what makes sense to them. That is never the way to go. With Jesus and John, what made them different? They were eyewitnesses. So it wasn't like they read something or heard something. They were eyewitnesses. That's important. And then Jesus tried to make a comparison between basic things versus more complicated things, or we could say earthly things versus heavenly things. Maybe earthly things we would say are like one plus one equals two. Maybe more complex things would be like a simple algebra problem, 10 minus 10 plus X equals 15 minus 10. So if you look at it for a couple seconds, right away you would know the answer for someone who's a little bit familiar with algebra, but for other people, though, they wouldn't know. 
Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel. You should know not only the basic things, you should know the complex things. And yet Nicodemus was not willing to accept what Jesus was saying. Jesus being the son of God, he could look into the heart of Nicodemus and he could know he was not yet a believer. How did Jesus know heavenly things? Well, he told Nicodemus, he said, he was in heaven and then he descended he was saying to him i am the son of man i am the promised messiah therefore you should listen to me i know what i'm talking about that's what he was saying to nicodemus and then in the final part here jesus explained his saving work so we come to some passages now that are um, not really so much on the topic of born again. These are familiar passages, but they are important and they fit in with what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Nicodemus would have been very familiar with the account of Moses and the poisonous serpents. Nicodemus being a teacher of the law, familiar with the Old Testament, and so on. Now, Nicodemus, though, even though he was familiar with the account, he probably didn't understand why the people who were bitten by the poisonous snakes and then looked at what Moses had set up with the staff and the bronze snake on the staff, he probably didn't understand. So Jesus was saying to him, they were not healed because of Moses. They were not healed because of the staff and the bronze serpent. Why were they healed? He wanted people to understand that when they looked, they were looking with God-given faith in the promise that had been made. God told Moses, when people look with faith, believing that when they look, that they will be healed, God gave the people faith, they looked in faith, and they did not die, they were healed. Keep in mind, many, many people died, but the ones who looked in faith did not physically die from the snake bites. And then Jesus also talked about how he would die. He talked about being lifted up, thinking about death on the cross, being lifted up upon the cross and put to death. How are people saved? We are saved when God gives us that gift of saving faith by which we look to Jesus with that saving faith. And when we do, by the grace of God, when we do, coming from Jesus to us is that clothing of righteousness. How does that tie in with baptism? In baptism, God is giving the child the gift of faith. And with that faith, the child is receiving that clothing of righteousness. And then it is so important for the parents to begin to teach all these important things for their children so that they grow up understanding, oh, I am a baptized child of God. I am forgiven in Christ. I have on the clothing of Christ. Yes, I'm a sinner, but when God looks upon me, God isn't seeing my sin. God is seeing the perfect life of Jesus. All these wonderful things fit together, but how many young people, though, even understand these fundamental things? So important from the Word of God. And then we come to the famous verse here, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It is because of God's great love that he gave his Son. Not because, any, not because of any goodness in us, but because of God's great love, he gave his Son, and he did that so that everyone who believes in him would have the gift of eternal life, would, by God's grace, continue in Christ to the end and finally be with God forever. When we think about eternal life, let's understand that is the best of everything. Eternal life is the best of everything, but for those who are without Jesus, they are on their way to a situation 
that is the worst of everything. And with both situations, with God or apart from God, let's hear what the Bible is saying. These locations are forever. We, we can't even comprehend that, but it, it is so very long. We want to make sure, by the grace of God, by the work of Christ, we want to make absolutely sure that we are going to be in that right place forever and ever. God has offered it. God is promising it. God wants to work it within us. But again, though, I'm afraid that so many just are not interested. So sad. Finally, Jesus said, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Did you notice that three times there he referred to the world? He wants us to understand that he sent his Son into the world for everyone, to live for everyone, to die for everyone, to save everyone. My final thought here in the sermon today, kind of a plea to everyone who is spiritually dead, to everyone who is currently without Christ, my plea is to stop clinging to your own goodness that cannot get you into heaven. Stop, stop clinging to your own feelings. Oh, I feel okay. I think everything's going to turn out okay. Stop clinging to that type of thing that cannot save us. What did Jesus say? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is the truth? The truth is that only in Jesus Christ is there eternal salvation. So let us stop clinging to anything other than who Jesus is and what he has done. And then knowing him, let us rejoice, knowing our sins are forgiven. We are alive in Christ. We are God's holy children. We are heaven bound. Then we can live with peace. Then we can seek and follow God's will. And we can go through life honoring him and being a blessing to others so that they might know him too. Let us pray. Dear Holy Spirit, we are all at your mercy so we pray that you would please capture our attention. We pray that you would please open our hearts. We pray that you would please show us the truth. We pray that you would please make us sorry. And we pray that you would keep us always, always trusting in Jesus. In his holy name we pray. Amen.